Welcome to tonight's show. Welcome to those of you watching live and those of you who will watch later as well on the various platforms. Now, I'll introduce this evening's special guest in a little while, but just a few uh, few little business things before we get on to that. Uh, next week's show, unusually, we've got a few irons in the fire, but we haven't actually got anyone fixed for next week yet. The week after, we've got Anthony Samaroff, who is a member of the Scottish, a spokesman for the Scottish Libertarian Party. So we're going to have a debate, a little, uh, a little mini husting, so you can see which party you think uh, is the best out of the Libertarians and the Scottish Family Party. So that should be interesting in a couple of weeks' time. Now, it's our conference, of course, on Saturday. I've been mentioning that every week. Do sign up for that. It's morning and afternoon uh, online, and you can see the link uh, pinned to the top of our Facebook page under YouTube videos, uh, etc. So the conference is going to be really good. We've got all sorts of extremely interesting speakers on a, a really good range of topics, so don't miss that. It'd be good to have your interaction with that. Just to say as well, we are planning to actually live stream the conference as well. Now, if you just watch the live stream on Facebook or YouTube, you won't be able to interact. You won't be able to put questions in or comment or whatever. So it's much better to register for the conference and to be able to log in to the, to the webinar uh, software properly. But if you don't do that, say, you'll still be able to, uh, to watch it all being well. Now, talking of technical things, I'll just introduce you to our, our new toy. We've got here. This is the Scottish Family Party's uh, Pride and Joy. We just got this the other week, and that is a uh, a mini projector for outdoor use, and it enables us to project images onto buildings, I don't know, whatever else, landmarks, geographical features, people, whatever. So it's a campaigning tool, and it will project an image pretty big, bigger than my house. Put it that way. So we're going to have some fun out and about with that. Put in some provocative, uh, thought-provoking. Uh, well, well, we'll see what happens when we go out. In fact, we've got a plan for tomorrow night, so watch this space. So that's something we've tried to do for a long time. We've had a lot of uh, problems finding the right technical equipment, but now we've got it and we're ready to go. So keep an eye on our social media and see what we've been up to. I think we're going to have a lot of uh, a lot of fun and games with that. Uh, on the YouTube channel, what we've been doing, we've been doing a lot about this with BLM, anti-racist indoctrination going on in schools. Well, it's quite shocking what's going on. What happens with these? You make a video or two, then more and more people start sending you things. So you could go on forever with it. Uh, I've got another video coming out tomorrow on the topic, uh, which is about exam results and race, and people are trying to detect racism in the exam results. I mean, you need to watch that to believe it. But someone also sent a clip from George Watson's College. George Watson's College is an independent school just down the road from me. And they'd had a Black History Month. And they got some of their pupils explaining about white privilege there in their, in their very smart independent school uniforms. I just wanted to suggest, come, please, could one of you go down to Wester Hales Education Centre, which is not such a well-off area, let's put it that way, and go and explain to the kids down there about white privilege. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. And anyway, so that's a few things uh, going on in the background. It's time to turn to this evening's guest. Uh, we're delighted to have with us this evening, David Scott. Welcome, David. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Now, I would imagine a lot of you might recognize David's face if you have watched the UK column, sort of alternative media uh, news program. You'll have seen David, but so it's good to have David with us. David is the, the Scottish correspondent reporter from UK column. Yes, we, we, I, I think we're the, the doyen of British alternative media. We are, we are, we are it, I think. Uh, that's, uh -huh. that's, how, that's how thin on the ground British alternative media is, unfortunately. But uh, we're, we're, we're doing our best and we've got a, a, a huge uptake, uh, a huge increase in, in, uh, in viewership uh, in the last nine months with the uh, clampdown uh, by the government over COVID. Yeah, yeah. Now, now David's interest in lots of areas that overlap with the family party's interests. So there's various things we could end up talking about tonight. We will we'll, we will be ad-libbing. But we're going to start, I suppose, with one, one of our central themes, and that's the state and family life, which of all places, uh, that's an important issue. It's important here in Scotland. So David, tell us a bit about your experience campaigning researches into this area 
Well, it's, I've come across this subject a, a great deal. I mean, we, we have people writing to us and we get their stories in. But perhaps a, a place to start would be the, the No to Name Person campaign. Because uh, I followed this quite closely because the, one of the... Um, one of the bodies taking the case to the UK Supreme Court was a charity called the, the Times Trust, which uh, my wife was a trustee of at the time. So she was doing talks and they had road shows and things. So I, I was tagging along and, uh, and listening to what was going on and hearing all the people speaking. And um, out came a picture of... Uh, the, the 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 state being a real bully when it came up when they came up against an individual family, so the sort of thing that would be quite common is uh, mum would be called in to usually the school um, for some sort of conference. There was, there's a problem, and in she would go and she'd find herself flanked by six or seven or eight or ten caring professional people from all sorts of agencies. So the state had shared all this information and they had decided before she ever got there, their position. So this 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 poor mum, and it was usually a mum, uh, would find herself um, up against you know, a, a, a sea of faces, um, mm -hmm. all of whom are speaking with some sort of claimed authority and all of whom are sit telling her how badly she's doing and mm -hmm. they have a line, and they're pursuing it. Now, the, uh, one of the strange things is that if you come into conflict with one part of the state, because the state's now under the Scottish model of government, we might come to more detail on that in a little while, but under the Scottish model of government, there are no departmental boundaries as functional items anymore. It's one tightly coordinated integrated state. So if you come into conflict with any part of it, you come into conflict with the whole thing. And that's that's new, I think. The Scottish model of government came in with the Salmon government, the Salmon administration, 2007. Um, it's 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 a, a fresh approach. They claimed it was a fresh approach. They said it was new. It was. And you're now up against the whole of the state. So if you come out come up against a conflict over the health of your child, which is actually quite a common one, where the health officials might have a different view from the parents, you then put yourself into conflict with the entire state, including social work, police enforcement, um, family, um, uh, legal services, a children's panel, the whole mm -hmm. thing. Um, so with ME is the the, the uh, disease that my the, the charity my wife worked for was dealing with the Times Trust is the, the young ME sufferers trust, and they were finding that it's a politicised disease. The official line on how it should be treated is uh, you have graded exercise therapy, and you have cognitive behavioural therapy, because the official line is it's really all in your head. It's, it's your beliefs that are wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, this would be great if it was true, uh, but it's not true. So what happens over and over again is that the children are subjected to this graded exercise therapy. And one of the things with ME is that exercise makes them worse. It, it, it's, it, it, exercise will generate huge amounts of fatigue, uh, post-exertion fatigue. So what the parents were seeing was this therapy making their children very much and very rapidly deteriorate. So they were opting out of the therapy. And then um, all hell would let loose because they were then accused of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And when that became untenable, they, uh, they changed its name but it was the same disease, the same, the same claim, the same mm -hmm. syndrome. Um, they would have wrongful child protection hearings uh, filed against them. And you would have huge amounts of conflict with the school. Social work would get involved. Pressure would, pressure would become intense. And, and parents 
whose only crime is to have a child who's sick and to not agree with the medical professional as to how that sick child should be treated because the treatment's making them worse, are being hauled mm -hmm. up in front of the children's panel. And the threat is, we'll take the child off you and and and, and put the child into a into children's home because you are toxic as a parent. Now, mm -hmm. th this is the sort of pressure that, that comes on. And the, watching how the Times Trust operated was, was very revealing as well because the, the atmosphere is one of bullying. You have your 10 professionals, they have a meeting beforehand, the parent walks in and is bombarded with demands and, and basically ultimatums and doesn't know how to react. What the, the, the Times Trust was doing was putting someone in there with the parent. And that one mm -hmm. person not only was expert in the field and knew the disease, but had access to medical professionals who were the leading professionals in the field and um, medical papers to back up everything they said. So you had a very calm professional response. And they would go in and say, no, this is, this is, this is not correct what you're saying. The reality is, and they'd explain just what the disease was. They'd explain how the, the um, treatments being being demanded are actually harmful. They'd back it up with medical evidence. They'd point out the, the requirement the state had to actually operate in the interest of the child. Uh, and sometimes within like one or two meetings, this enormous bullying an attack on the parent, which was heading towards removing the child, and it was sometimes very close, mm -hmm. immediately turned round and was heading in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And the, the difference was that the parent was no longer alone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah but my, my first point is there is a bullying aspect that's really unpleasant when you see it. Um, and the parents who go into who go in thinking that the state is there to help and protect them uh, are sometimes in for a terrible surprise. Yeah. Well, I've heard uh, teachers, social workers, et cetera, they explain the system and they reassure parents that we involve you in the decision-making process. <laughs> that's supposed to be reassuring. That's not, I mean, that's the completely the opposite, isn't it? They should be, you know, the parents come in and you know, they're seated at the throne at the head of the table. And then you know the meeting goes on for that, but they really think they've they've more than done enough to to invite the parents to meet him. But I just say, I think the attitude is the it's a professionalization attitude, isn't it? The professionals know best in every context. The parents are, are, are bumbling amateurs, and so we need to um, we need to overrule them. But when it comes to something like a, an illness, though, if they've you know they're pushing a treatment that's not been helpful. I mean, why did that happen? The people involved, obviously, they're not thinking, you know, that we really want to harm the children and make them more ill, so we're going to force this on them. Uh, but do you think in some cases it's just sort of overconfidence in uh, uh, one particular professional opinion? Well, the, the, increasing with the state is, is showing an attitude that there can be only one truth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all centralised. Now, if error captures the center under those circumstances, error captures everything. Yeah. Now, in the, in the case of NE, um, my view uh, and, and a, a view of a lot of people in the who, who either have suffered ME or uh, who, who have uh, close relatives who have suffered, mm -hmm. is that it's a real physical disease. It affects the central nervous system. Um, it's uh, likely a, a form of polio. In fact, one of its early names was atypical polio and one of the early huge outbreaks was at a polio hospital in, mm -hmm. in London. Um, and the psychiatric profession um, has come in and has claimed it's in fact a mental health problem. And there is a fight over jurisdiction mm -hmm. and the psychiatrists are winning. So mm -hmm. what's happening is 
that you have uh, elements within the medical profession for reasons unknown, but I would point out that there is very substantial funding and um, and financial benefits that accrue to individuals um, when they get recognised by the state as being authorities. But for whatever reason, um, the psychiatrists have moved in and um, uh, one in particular called Simon Wesley. Um, and they have a f they have changed the definition of what good treatment means. And that permeates the state and it keeps cropping up. And mm -hmm. people further down the tree um, are trained very much to obey. Right? What's the word from on high? What's the prescribed way forward? People are not thinking for themselves further down the chain of command. There's not a lot of independent thought going on. So mm -hmm. they're they're taking the, the defined way forward. Well, that's that's the answer. And the, the degree to which is difficult to is difficult to not talk about this in terms of belief, because the, the degree to which the faith in the state as the arbiter of what is right and what is wrong, and what is good and what is bad, has permeated society is very mm -hmm. substantial. And then the state and the state employees will respond as though that this is the only possible truth. And yeah. they will not question what they are doing. They will not mm -hmm. question the accuracy of the information. One of the things was the name person that was most striking. And it, it there was cases where uh, there was one chap who was a um, single father and he was um, a, a lecturer at one of the universities in Aberdeen. I forget which which university. Um, and you know, so he was you know an established person with a with a with an excellent career, intelligent, well read. Mm -hmm. You would think it's not the sort of person that, that that would be targeted by social services, but he was, and he couldn't get them to leave him alone and everything that he did was interpreted in a negative way mm -hmm. um, and they had a huge file and he tried to get the file and he got it, it was mostly redacted and he tried and he tried and he tried and when he finally got the file I mean they were recording everything right if the kids had nappy rash that was recorded mm -hmm. right there was a, there was clearly an attempt to get this guy and get mm -hmm. involved in his life and get involved in his family life. And he was saying, I don't need your help. Leave me alone. And it took him years to mm -hmm. get them to leave him alone. Mm -hmm. and, and there's there's this kind of belief that we are right, right? Because we're working for the government and the government's always right. And you're just a parent. Mm -hmm. And... And, and the assumption is that the parents are wrong. The parents are in the wrong. I, I, and the, I, I see this very, very frequently. Mm -hmm. there's, there's one case I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at just now, a lady who has lost, um, well, her son is, is in care at the moment. And she's able to see him uh, for supervised contact only, only supervised. Mm -hmm. For four hours a year, mm -hmm. four hours a year, and I've looked at the paperwork and the the the, the justification for four hours a year was, well, she didn't engage well with social services. Mm -hmm. No kidding, you took her son away. She's not happy with you. Yeah, I, yeah. and and we think she's mental health problems, but she doesn't agree. Mm -hmm. So. It's non-compliance. Mm -hmm. Non-compliance is a big problem. So it becomes dangerous to have your own opinion, right? The fact that you're right doesn't save you mm -hmm. because you're up against an organization that doesn't have a means of determining whether you're right because decisions are made at the top and passed down. They're not really made at the low level. They're defined for the people further down. There's a little bit of on-the-ground judgment.
Mm -hmm. um, but but the big picture is defined at a high level and passed down. So it's it's very controlled. And if you're up against that as a parent, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think they sometimes listening in the parliament. I mean, they love the experts, the representatives of the children's charities, etc., who've got a, a in some cases quite an extreme philosophy of, of child rearing, child care. And so you, you think you know, who is representing the voice of parents within the parliament? I know that this is a completely different different issue, which just illustrates the sort of thing I'm talking about. I mean, they were talking about fireworks the other day in the Scottish Parliament. Now you can imagine they'll have every group going who can come along and say there's a problem with fireworks. You know, the fire brigade or pet owners or whatever. All these people come along so talking about the problems. But where do they get the representative of the sort of ordinary family who just finds it great fun? And yeah, it's a little bit dangerous, but that's what makes it exciting. And they really love it. Where does that voice come from? So, you know, there isn't a sock puppet charity representing the ordinary families, those views. And I think that's, that's what happens in the parliament so it gets to the point where even the politicians i think who are parents or they don't trust their own instincts they just the culture is you just trust the professionals what they say goes and the professionals and the charities are by and large state funded now all the big ones mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, receive such heavy state funded grants yeah that they are they are wholly owned um so one of the aspects of the scottish model of government is it doesn't stop with government. It goes into the charities. So they become mm -hmm. de facto extensions of government. So you yeah. cannot get a charity, Times Trust and a few others accepted because they don't take the government coin. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a if you've got government funded charities, you cannot get the charity to defend you against the state mm -hmm. because it's not in their interest. Because the phone yeah. will go and there'll be a hint that the, the line that you are taking on this is, is, is very worrying. I'm not sure how this will, will uh, be viewed when your funding comes up for renewal. Mm -hmm. That phone call will be made. Yeah. It's interesting watching these charities. Sometimes you'll come across them. I, think I was looking at uh, uh, Girl Guides uh, the other week. I was looking at on, uh, the Poppy Scotland. And you look at their website and you see there's all this equality and diversity and you know, all the government's buzzwords and you just think right let, let's check i know what that means you're getting government funding so you're going to check in the small print and sure enough there it is but it's very tempting isn't it if you're running a little organization it's completely transformative sums of money are available for you just you know, swallowing a bit of this this ideology and, and passing it on it's it, it's hugely tempting but it's, it's hugely sinister as well, I mean, is there any other country in the world where it's as rampant as it is in Scotland? I'm not sure. I, I think it's ex at the real extreme end of the spectrum in Scotland. It's, it's very bad here. Now, the the uh, the charities are also involved in in policy generation, mm -hmm. right? Because the government require intellectual cover. Right? The, the, they're attacking the family unit. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm convinced that that is part of the agenda. And you know the communist manifesto destroy the family it's not it's not new this idea we're going mm -hmm. to remake society families families viewed as problematic families have different opinions lots of yeah. different opinions all sorts of different opinions mm -hmm. unapproved opinions mm -hmm. some of them believe in god some of them don't like other people for reasons that we don't approve of some mm -hmm. of them have lifestyles that we don't like there's all mm -hmm. sorts of things some of them well, i mean a very problematic family so there's mm -hmm. there's a view that it's we need to get the state needs to get in there and sort this, and there's a view that the state generally, if you go if you dig deeper, it's worse than that. That it's actually looking to destroy the family because we can't remake society at all the way we want to, while people mm -hmm. have this anchor of their own yeah. loved ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, the family is viewed as a problem. The state's making legislation that's attacking the family, but people like families. Mm -hmm. People, the people don't want this, so the state needs to have 
intellectual cover. It needs a, it needs a, it needs a cover story. And the cover story is all these all these charities. Charity is a good thing. So all these charities, they all support us. Mm -hmm. In fact, we are responding. They they came up with some of these ideas. We're just responding to what the charities asked us to do. It's not us. Yeah. It's the mm -hmm. charities. So that's the answer. So the charities, people like Bernardo's, um, you know, organizations with a horrendous backstory of child abuse, by the way. Mm -hmm. All forgiven now, though, are getting enormous government funding for being involved in the the state child care system. Mm -hmm. So they will not argue against the state child care system. They will only argue for more funding for the state child care system because it needs more funding for it. And they will develop policies like the name person policy. The name person policy was developed with uh, with Children First and Bernardos, and these people had a seat at the table. Yeah, And we've seen the minutes. They sat down and they said, we're going to run this out through professional services, professional practice, and we're going to get it well embedded then so the whole thing's running. And then we're going to tell the people, mm -hmm. not before. Yeah. So this sort of stuff is going on in the background. The charities are the ones that are taking big government funding complicit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just going back to the... The family, what this is, the problem of the family. There's another two aspects as well. Why, we well, say the government, but it's the whole parliament really. I mean, there's not really much much of a spectrum there of opinion. The other thing they don't like about families is they see them as producing inequality. You hear things like, you know, that they test kids on the first day of school or when they go to nursery, and they find that kids in poor areas, they don't do quite as well. And that so conclusion, the parents in those poor areas must be really rubbish. So we need to take over from them. Leave it to families, you get inequality. The other thing they hate with families is that you get that division of roles along gender lines. Because for all of their efforts, they still tend to, families tend to choose to some degree uh, the traditional division of roles. And, and they just hate that. They can't stand that. So again, that's another reason to move away from family. I mean, you mentioned, I mean, we talk about the, you know, what the early communists, what they're in. not saying the Scottish government's communist, but just saying you can see the line of thinking coming through it. And that was one of the reasons why they wanted to abolish the family was in order to achieve gender equality. They said that but, women but, will only but, be liberated when yeah. they're at work in the factory, exactly the same as men, and the kids are in the state childcare facility. But even took it, I mean, with the school meals and the holiday thing as well, they also had the idea that, you know, we don't want people having to cook in their own homes because, again, that generates inequality. So we should have communal dining rooms for families and children as well. And, and things are slowly but surely stepping in that direction. You say the, you say the Scottish government's not communist. Well, let me, let, me, let me kick the tires on that one a little bit. The ideas of the Scottish government mostly come from America. From think tanks in America. Um, a lot of these think tanks opened up in Scotland around about 1999 when the new parliament was coming because they wanted to be in early to influence this new decision making body. They saw mm -hmm. it as an opportunity. In come the ideas. Now, the ideas, if you start digging back where they come from, right, they come from postmodernism, right? So political correctness. Um, is one example. And people think it's just like politeness going a bit wrong, but it's no, it's it's far more pernicious. Mm -hmm. this. this is to this is to break down belief systems. It's all part of critical theory, right? And critical theory is to attack what it sees as the enlightenment values, which they want to destroy. The, the modern society that they want to destroy by by subjecting it to unrelenting and never-ending criticism until it collapses mm -hmm. under the under the effect mm -hmm. so when you look at the policies with respect to race and white privilege and all this which is to tell people your your background is shameful your your mm -hmm. nation is shameful your skin color is shameful or at least problematic um you you cannot be you, you you cannot be proud of your national background. You have to you have to.
be apologizing for it. That's part of critical theory because taking out the nation, taking out the family, taking out the church, taking out these things that bring people together mm -hmm. is part of it because they're wanting to destroy society. They're wanting to rebuild it along Marxist lines, but first you have to destroy it. So when you say they're not communists, you are correct, they're not communists. But what they are is authoritarian socialists in this postmodern form, which is which is quite adjacent, right? Marxism is at the heart of both. So you, you an, an, an attack on property rights, an attack on the family, an attack on the nation, an attack on faith, it's all part of what is motivating them. And you see this um, very frequently. There was one um, SMP MP um, who voted against the uh, introduction of abortion into Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And the abuse that she got from the SMP activists was horrendous. Mm -hmm. They tried to mm -hmm. get her deselected. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it was looking touch and go. And it was actually the support from the Roman Catholic Church that, that probably turned the, turned the mm -hmm. corner. She's not Catholic herself, but the mm -hmm. Roman Catholic Church supported the line she'd taken. Mm -hmm. And she was getting horrendous abuse from the activists who are steeped in this ideology. So if you stand for any of these things, particularly things like the right to life of the unborn child, um, any sort of idea of marriage as it's been understood until the last few years, um, the nation as an extension of the family, so your ties of blood, any anything like that is mm -hmm. is viewed as is actively toxic, if not hate filled. Yeah. So yeah. and this is this is critical theory is painting painting ideas which were normal just a few years ago as as so problematic, as so unpleasant as to be noxious to make them literally unsayable so that's that's what the scottish government is part of that's what the smp uh, yeah sort of higher ups are part of yeah part I've, of got, I've, got a, I've got a theory about this seriously this is my theory so i mean this this like critical theory the idea they're basically going to pull down western civilization replace it with a, a on a sort of marxist model i mean that's that's what academics teach uh, in, in lots of universities around the world. It's very influential. Now, I believe, for example, the, the Green Party in the Scottish Parliament, I, I think they really get that. I think they know what they're doing, and that's what they're aiming for. I think the SNP, and basically pretty well the rest of them, I think they don't really realise what they're doing. They just genuinely fall for the lines. So the, so the next thing's presented to them as, oh, you know, critical race theory, that, that's just about being nice to people of other races. And that they don't see through it and see its actual meaning. So they're being duped in effect. So they are pushing that agenda, but they don't realize it. Am I being too generous? Or do you think that could be the, the case? No, I, I, I see what you're saying. I mean, I, I think you're right. The Greens do, the Greens are fully on board. Uh -huh. they're, they're, they're no holds, they're no holds barred. Mm -hmm. um, the SNP. I mean, I've, I've probably not spoken to as many SNP politicians as you have. Um, I would say that most of the most of the politicians are probably duped as opposed to being on board. Yeah, they well, or they, or they, they just they go with the flow. They, yeah, the they don't really know what they're what they're actually mm -hmm. selling. Mm -hmm. um, the activists, there's an element of the activists who are completely on board as well. Mm -hmm. um, they are, they, some of them are really quite toxic. Yeah. Uh, well, I was talking to an MSP once, and they said that what happens with a huge proportion of the speeches you hear in the Scottish Parliament is that the, the MSP will be there on the morning. They've got to give a speech in the afternoon, seven minutes. Oh, they don't know what to do. But then a few emails arrive from campaigning organisations that basically tell them what to say. And most MSPs just copy and paste a few bits from these emails they get then stand up and deliver it, and that's their speech. And you can listen to debates. You can hear the same things being said over and over again. And you can see that's obviously what happens. I mean, I, I'm sure if it became in their interest, let, let, let's imagine, let's, for example, I, you know, I, I'm the first minister. I've got all the power. If you want to get on in politics, you need to agree with me. 
how many of these how many of these MSPs would be right with me in a couple of months' time? I think a good a good proportion would be able to do the flip. I think if it was in their interests. Now, now I mean, what's worse? What's worse? Actually, knowing what you're doing, um, and you know, the, the, and the you know, the problems with that, or just being unprincipled and going with the flow. I, I don't know which one's worse. We well, see this. This is this is why when families are up against the the ranks of professionals, these caring professionals, mm -hmm. um, a proportion of the time that the experience is so toxic, and it's because of the goal with the flow. It's not just the people who are nasty and out to get you. They exist, right? Mm -hmm. There's the abusers. There's the there's Satanist ritual abusers. There's all sorts of nasties mm -hmm. embedded in professional services and, and some really nasty types are attracted towards children's services for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, there, are, there are people out there who are malign. But the majority is not that. But but the the organisation of a, as a whole has this. Well, we'll just go with the flow. That's mm -hmm. what we've been told to do. That's what we're going to do. And they will not. They will not stand against it, because mm -hmm. the conditions of contract are such that that it's that they're toast. Right. So mm -hmm. if you work for the state, if you're in a social work department, and you think what's happening there is unlawful, is uh, excessive, is prejudicial to the interests of the children, is motivated for entirely the wrong reasons. What do you do? Well, mm -hmm. if you speak about it internally, you will be crushed, mm -hmm. right? Because th th these are fear-filled organizations. My experience of them is there's a lot of internal fear. Mm -hmm. If you speak about it externally, if you speak about it publicly, in the mildest possible way, you will be disciplined. Mm -hmm. And in anything more than that, if it doesn't stop, you're gone. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're yeah. something like a teacher and you lose your job in the public sector, you lose your career. Mm -hmm. right? you go and get a job driving a van or something because you're finished. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not happening. You'll not get a job in another Scottish local authority. Mm -hmm. Word will get around. So th there's a lot of fear. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, the government's just got a, a grip on so many areas of life. But I've probably said this before on the live stream, but it's, it's interesting with the family party. So after you say to someone, oh, you'd be a really good candidate. How about that? What do you think? Ah, well, there's a bit of a problem. Uh, you see, I, I work for so-and-so, or my wife works for so-and-so, or I do a course, or I might want to apply for this in the future. Or, I mean, sometimes it's just that social stigma as well. You know, I, I, I'm just the the response to my colleagues. You know, I, I just couldn't couldn't think about it. It would, would just be too much. And it's a serious, serious problem. I mean, when I was teaching, I worked in a, a sort of expensive all boys boarding school. Okay, which you you would think might be about as conservative as you, as you might get in terms of staff opinion. But during the the uh, Brexit campaign. I mean, people, people knew what I thought. I mean, a couple of members of staff came to me quietly and said, you know, I, I'm going to vote for Brexit, by the way. I don't tell anyone, though. So even in that context, people, people are afraid to even sort of express mainstream political views. You're know, let alone challenging the ideology that, that's driving the whole institution. I mean, again, is that a, a particular Scottish thing? I mean, my impression, it is that the SNP does gain influence one way or another in virtually every aspect of life. And there are not many people who just feel completely free to say and do what they really want to. Almost everyone's got some reason to just, just stop and think, you know, is this worth the price you might have to pay for challenging I, this? I, I got an indication of this back in 2014 after the referendum. And I, I got onto a train at uh, Waverley uh, to come up to Perth. And it happened to be one of the, the the big trains, the one from London. So it was quite plush. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a seat opposite this little Scottish lady who must have been about 60. And she was, so we, we got talking. And 
we were talking, it was just after the referendum. So I, I raised mm -hmm. this. And it was quite clear that she'd voted to stay in the UK. Mm -hmm. And when she came to tell me that, she whispered. Because she was frightened that someone in the carriage would hear her political opinion, which was yeah. the majority opinion. It just won. Yeah. Yep. And come <laughs> and get in her face and give her hassle. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, something's, something's changed in my country here because that, that wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. That would not have happened before. She wouldn't have right. felt the need to whisper. So there is a fear. And, and this, is, this is where the people who are saying that this is it's not politics, politics is downstream of culture, have got something. Because it's the cultural abandonment of, of everything we used to believe in. Mm -hmm. And the cultural decision that we're not going to stick up for these things anymore, even though we really think they're right. Mm -hmm. We're just going to slide off and, and, and say nothing. Mm -hmm. That cultural surrender drives an awful lot of the problems we're seeing. Problems in children's services, problems with dealing with the state, problems in parliament, because it it comes with a surrender of the ability to think for oneself. Mm -hmm. It comes with uh, an abandonment that of the principle that as a nation, we should be able to have different views, different households, different people should have different views, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And we should debate these things and the quality of the debate and the best ideas should triumph. That's that's gone because we're now just no platforming people. We don't we don't argue against them. Mm -hmm. We don't platform them. But we're not no. going to debate them because that would be to give them the oxygen of publicity. We have to shut them down. We have to make them invisible. Yeah. Oh, tell me about it. I mean, the, the number of people I've invited to come onto this live stream and debate. Uh, we haven't had anyone yet, have we? No, I don't think anyone's come on to actually take a completely... I mean, you, know, you disagree on various things with different people, but no one to come on, you know, knowing they're coming on with the country. But if you, so we invite and invite, but people just won't do it. But if I was... I mean, surely you would think, some of them would think, you know, I'm so sure I'm right. I can go and educate this man and his, his viewership. Surely I should take this opportunity... But well, I think what they're thinking, that it's a risk for them. Because, again, they might be think they're going to be damned by association. They'll yes. be in trouble for doing it. Yes. Or, or they, no, they, they absolutely would be because their own side would attack them. Uh -huh. right? for, giving, for giving you credibility. Yeah. Right? Because if, 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 if I'm going to debate you, right, uh -huh. that means I think that your ideas are worth debating. Yeah. That means I think that your ideas are in some way valid. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. because you wouldn't debate a Nazi. Well, actually, I would debate a Nazi. I think it'd be quite interesting to debate a Nazi because I think mm -hmm. their ideas are wrong, and I would be more than happy to do that. But their yeah. view was, you wouldn't debate a Nazi. You wouldn't debate something that's that's literally a disgusting point of view, uh -huh. and that's how they're trying to paint anyone who disagree disagrees. And of course, it's not even static because where mm -hmm. they were ten years ago is now the disgusting point of view. And they're, yep. they're moving on. If you look at um, the introduction of queer theory into schools, right, that's not going to stop there. If you look at post-humanism mm -hmm. and queer theory and the, the connection of the two, that's quite a scary read as well. You've got this huge anti-human ideology mm -hmm. permeating into – and, and it, it, in academic – worlds it's discussed people mm -hmm. are writing papers on this people yep. are getting phds and doctorates and master's degrees because they're writing this sort of stuff so it's respectable mm -hmm. right? a, a mainstream 1950s british view of the world is no longer respectable these extreme views are yep. and they're permeating into the culture through the schools through the universities yeah, just going back to the, you know, won't share a platform with. I did a debate, it's quite a few years ago now, uh, with that about um, prostitution. So as myself, I had a road of grant for Labour MSP and a couple of prostitutes there on stage. And at the question time, someone stood up and said to Rhoda Grant, you should be embarrassed. A 
sharing a stage with with me. <laughs> so, so, so pr prostitutes, no problem, no problem at all. No as problem. I didn't have a problem. No, no, no mention of that. Uh, but she should have been embarrassed to share a platform with me. When I re replied, I, mean, I could have said, I'm sharing a platform with someone from the Labour Party, taking a significant risk of being disinherited in the process. But like you say, complete, complete reversal and utter confidence that that sort of inverted morality is just cast iron solid. And you know, it's a really firm place to stand and you, you can assert your authority from that position. Be because in the world that they operate, in the echo chamber they operate, it's repeated, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's constantly repeated. And you hear, I, I was picking up uh, a little clip of Nicola Sturgeon meeting a constituent from Govan Hill. It, it didn't go well. Um, uh -huh. And she said to, the, the constituent said, you know, what, have you, have you actually stood up in Parliament and talked about Govan Hill? So Nicola was obviously trying to remember if she ever had and suspected she hadn't. So she was trying to get off the hook, mm -hmm. right? So she says to him, you know, I, um, you know, I'm I'm always working for Govan Hill, and 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 you know this. And she goes on, and he, the the chap let her finish, and then he said, "I'll tell you what I know." And then he reiterated the problem with Govan Hill, so he, he didn't fall for it. But this, mm -hmm. and and you know this, and we all agree on this. This type of constantly self reinforcing mm -hmm. yeah. um, dialogue happens all the time in the circles they operate in. That they yeah. They don't meet different views. Now, people who might be in the Scottish Family Party, people who uh, might have my view on, say, either Christianity or, um, say, economics, uh, I'm a mm -hmm. uh, follower of the Austrian School of Economics, the, these are unpopular views. You go into a room and you start discussing views that you think are interesting. You're going to assume that probably three quarters of that room is going to disagree with you and mm -hmm. one quarter might really disagree with you might really have a go mm -hmm. and you're thinking okay i can handle that you go in with that mindset because you're defending an unpopular position you need to know your stuff mm -hmm. one thing that you learn very quickly is what the other side is going to come back with because it's everywhere mm -hmm. permeates the culture so if you if you turn on the BBC, if you turn on if you open the Guardian, you get the propaganda all the time. It's the same note the whole time, and it's constant. Now, mm -hmm. if you can if you can deal with that, if you can overcome that, and you think, well, okay, I understand why you're saying, and that's wrong because, and you have your argument, and you can stand up against that. You can go and talk to the other side. Mm -hmm. They never do that. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't listen mm -hmm. to what you might think or what I might think. They, they, it's immediately, that's unsayable. How dare you get the hands? Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. As, it was, as a result, they have no comprehension of what you actually believe or I actually believe and no ability to argue the point. Yeah, I think so, that's, what, that, that's one of the reasons why maybe some people don't want to debate. Because I know... Uh, when I speak to someone about a, a controversial issue, it's normally the situation where I think I understand where they're coming from. I've heard I've heard it before, and I've got a rough idea of, of their underlying philosophy. Whereas often they haven't got the faintest clue uh, of what I'm trying to say. And it's not uh, willful. It's just they've never heard it before. So whenever you have these exchanges, people learn about the sort of alternative views. There's not really much to learn by hearing the same old thing just repeat it again. So maybe they've got a point in thinking, well, debating doesn't help us. But what you're saying about the BBC is really interesting. Because if you imagine that you are of the sort of progressive mindset, so that it's a BBC mindset, then you, you turn on the national broadcaster and it just reinforces your beliefs day in, day out. Whether you wanted to or not, that's got to give you a real sense of confidence, at least, maybe even arrogance in the rightness of your beliefs, just having it constantly reinforced. Now, if you have to go finding something on the internet uh, to be uh, someone talking about what you believe and reinforce your beliefs, then that doesn't strengthen your uh, your confidence in the same way, does it? Because it's not the mainstream. It's something that's a bit more niche. But the BBC, I think, has got a huge amount to answer for in society, partly because of its own output, partly because all the other 
the mainstream media have to group around the BBC in order to be seen to be neutral, in order to, to keep their licenses for broadcasting. So that's a massive issue. So our policy of the Scottish Family Party is to do away with the license fee and let the BBC uh, sink or float I, along with all the other media organisations. Um, yeah, I've got a little, let's see if I can find this, BBC. Yeah, I've got a little BBC quote. Um, you'll like this. Try not to laugh. This is from the Right Honourable Oliver Dowden, CBE MP. It says, I am writing. By the way, why pet hate in business is people who start off writing with the words, I am writing, because I can see that and I don't, mm -hmm. need, they don't need to tell me that. So he starts off, I am writing to confirm the scope and timing of the next licence fee settlement, which will start on the 1st of April 2022 and cover at least five years. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going to... Without laughing. <clears throat> the BBC is a world-class broadcaster. I can't do it with a straight face. The BBC is a world-class broadcaster, trusted and recognised across the globe. Its value has once again been highlighted in the vital role it is playing in keeping the nation unified, entertained and informed throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Unified? Mm -hmm. That is that's a government minister responsible uh -huh. for the BBC admitting that the BBC is a propaganda organ. Yeah, yeah. I've told someone I've got um someone who used to work for the BBC, a member of the Scottish Family Party. I, I didn't realise this. The BBC uh, foreign language channels. I don't know the, the World Service. They specifically for other countries. That's not paid for with a license fee. That's paid for out of taxation. Yes, foreign, foreign and Commonwealth Office, yeah. Yeah. I was just staggering. I was talking to someone in Iran a while ago. Um, it's very interesting. He was saying he can't stand the BBC because basically it pumps into Iran uh, Western liberal values they thought were undermining positive traditions in, uh, in Iran. I don't know if this fellow was a Muslim or not. I don't know what his other views were. But he could recognize that the, that the BBC was deliberately setting out to change the social values in Iran and what he thought was the wrong direction. I was, suspect we would probably agree on the issues that he was looking at. So we pay for that to be exported around the world. I mean, it, it's bizarre that this situation carries on for this yeah, long. The, the, Do you think the end is nigh for the BBC in its current form? Oh, it's 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 getting very shaky. Uh, uh -huh. They've got the, their budget was three and a half billion from the license fee, five billion per year total income. Mm -hmm. um, last year, they went from what was it now? It was something like a surplus of um, twenty or thirty something um, uh, million to a deficit of a hundred odd million. Mm -hmm. um, but their their the reserves went up by eight hundred million. You think, what? Mm -hmm. how, how did the reserves go up? They raided their pension fund. Mm -hmm. right? They raided their pension fund to tune of something like £900,000. So that, that tells me that's an organisation that thinks it's going to be needing the cash. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are turning off. A lot of people are no longer paying the licence fee. Uh, yeah. Hashtag defund the BBC runs more or less all the time on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they are... Um, nearing the end and if you look at the output it's it's so poor it's so uh -huh. dull yeah. they don't they can't do comedy anymore and they don't have any more than one note one opinion all the time yeah so it, it becomes very very boring i think yeah. they're going to lose out to far more interesting things you can get on the net yeah well i find it, on occasion i put radio four on in the car and it's normally about two minutes before they're on to uh, climate change, gender, race, or LGBT. Two minutes. Uh, I mean, the last time I turned the radio on, it was climate change, uh, but they were talking about the uh, underrepresentation of black and minority ethnic people in climate change campaigning organizations. <laughs> I, I, so whatever topic it is, sometimes I'll, I'll hear what the, you know, there's a documentary coming up about such and such a thing on Radio 4, and I'll think, well, I don't know anything about that at all. I haven't really got an interest in it. 
But whatever, I'll listen to what they've got to say. But two minutes in, it's into what's your experience as a woman in this field or, or, oh, yes. or whatever. As a, no one says anything anymore. They're all as a. Uh -huh. yeah. As a woman, uh, as a man, as a gay, as a something. Yeah. But someone was mentioning uh, Radio Scotland. Again, is that their morning, is it Kay Adams, their morning phone in thing? Just the spirit of it is the spirit of the Scottish Parliament. It's just, I watched the STV News because I was in it for a few seconds the other night. I don't normally see it. But again, the whole ethos of the news was just as though it was sliced from the Scottish Parliament, repackaged and put on TV. That monoculture all the way through. You, you, we started off talking about, about the experience of families. I've got one little thing here just to read to finish off. Uh -huh. um, this is from a, a, an article in the Scottish Review by Maggie Mellon entitled, To Get Justice in Scotland, You Must Be Rich or Popular. Uh, she writes here, Over two years ago, I was approached by a family whose two children had been removed on an emergency order and who were still being held in care several months later. The mother was accused of fabricating autism in the older child, child and thereby exposing the younger child to harm. The emergency order was obtained despite extended family members making it clear they would attend within hours if social workers had any reason to believe such a step was necessary. The whole family could not have been more impeccably respectable, with stable family life, successful careers, economic security, and close and supportive relationships. Despite this, the children were removed without warning. This was carried out by social workers with the attendance of uniformed policemen Late afternoon, one Friday. That's so you can't do anything till after the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, she goes on later on, these two children were not seen by any children's panel until they had been detained in care for over a year. During that year and after, both were deprived of the right to communicate independently with each other or with any member of their family. The children were not allowed to receive or make calls to the mother or other family members. They were not allowed to receive letters, gifts, books, toys, uh, they were not allowed to send private letters. Mm -hmm. um, those children, as far as I know, are still not with the family. Um, the family didn't do anything. The mm -hmm. social workers decided they were going to take them. Maggie goes on to explain that every single check and balance, every procedure was uh, broken. Every rule was broken by the social workers. Every, every appeal was turned down. The facts didn't seem to matter. Uh, another family destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, so the the attitude, this monoculture that you describe, does exist. Mm -hmm. But when it turns on individual people, individual people, individual families, it is horrendous and it mm -hmm. destroys lives. And that's why it's important to speak out. That's why it's important to have people who are mavericks, who are the different voice, who will yeah. speak out for people who get downtrodden. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. there's nobody. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just one parting shot on that issue. Uh, I've had a chat with uh, David the other day, and he suggested a family party policy. Uh, we're going to vote on it at, at the conference on Saturday. Get signed up for the conference. So this is going to be one, one of a, a few motions we take a vote on. But David suggested that when decisions have been made to take children away from a family, that it shouldn't be a decision of uh, a judge, etc. It should go to a jury. The... Uh, uh, the, the point being, we think a jury of 12, 15, whatever, sort of ordinary people would be much more reluctant to take a child away from a family. And I think there might well be be something in that. Do you want to give that, that policy a bit of a plug? Yeah, yeah. The, the view, and this was developed by a guy called Ian Joseph, who, who helps people who are fleeing British social services flee mm -hmm. abroad. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he came up with this. He said, no one, no one should lose a child unless a jury of your peers says it's right that it should be so. Mm -hmm. Not an official, not a judge, not a children's panel, not a professional, a jury of ordinary men and women. If they say yeah. you are so bad for your kids, they need to be taken off you, fair enough. But they won't do it lightly. They won't do mm -hmm. it frivolously. They won't do it because you disagree with a health professional about whether or not an autism diagnosis is correct when the family's loving and caring and the kids are happy and they're well looked after. They won't do that. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop it. Yeah, yeah. But Just to finish off, I think it's worth saying, I don't know anyone watching, you might be a social worker, 
teacher, obviously, obviously um, et cetera. Obviously, within these professions, people, uh, a huge number of people doing a lot of what they can to make things better uh, in people's lives. And a lot of that is effective. But what we're talking about here is, is a problem that's also running through these systems. So, you know, not, we're not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but just pointing out some problems that I think are all too real, as David's been demonstrating to us tonight. Well, I'm afraid that's nine o'clock. David, that was fascinating. So till next time, we'll have to have you back in a, in a little while to talk about some completely other uh, different topics. But there's lots of other things we could talk about as well. But that was uh, absolutely fascinating. So till well, next time. You. Well, thank you very much, Richard, for having me. I'd be delighted to have a chat again. And perhaps uh, you'll join me and get interviewed for, as I'm doing a series on, on new political voices in mm -hmm. the United Kingdom. And I'd like to have uh, you represent the Scottish Family Party to talk about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Right. Delighted to do that. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks for watching, everyone. And see you next week. Right. Good night.